Hi, welcome back to Educator.com. Today we're going to talk about composite functions. We are often going to have two or even more functions that interact with each other. This lesson will explore the fundamental ways that functions can interact with each other. First, we'll look at how functions can interact through good old arithmetic. Addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. These sorts of interactions are called arithmetic combinations because they're just using arithmetic. Second, we'll move on to a more complex idea, using one function's output as another function's input. We call this idea composition of functions. If we want to talk about a specific example, Example, we call that a composite function when we've put multiple functions together. All right, let's go. Let's say we've got two functions, f and g, and f of x is equal to x squared and g of x is equal to x. Nice basic functions. Now it's easy to imagine creating a new function that just adds f and g together. We'd call it f plus g. Not very imaginative, but it makes sense. It would give us the sum of the two functions. The new function f plus g of x would be equal to x squared plus x, right? We're just adding the two functions together. So we know each function is x squared and x, so we just add them together. Simple basic idea. We're using a basic arithmetic um, operation and we're just putting them together through that. So we've got arithmetic, let's use it. We could expand this idea to the other three basic operations. We could do this with subtraction. f minus g would become x squared minus x. fg of x would be x squared times x, fg being f times g, just like when we say 3x, we mean 3 times x. And f divided by g would be x squared over x. Simple as that. Given two functions, f and g, along with an x that's in the domain of both, we define these four different arithmetic combinations. So if x means something for f of x and x means something for g of x, right, it doesn't fail. Like if we had square root of x be one of them, we couldn't plug in negative three. But as long as it's in the domain of both, it's a number that both of them can accept and work on, all of these work really well. Sum is f plus g of x is just breaking down into adding the two together. Difference is just subtracting the one, you know, just like normal subtraction. Product, when we've got fg, it's we read it as times f times g. And quotient is f of x divided by g of x. And it also has to be that g of x does not equal zero, because otherwise we could accidentally, you know, wind up blowing the world up when we divide by zero, since we're not allowed to divide by zero because it's nonsense and doesn't mean anything. So since you can't divide by zero, it's not going to be defined when g of x is zero, since it would have to divide by zero. But other than that, we're pretty good to go. If it means something, if it comes out as a normal output, it's defined, that input is in the domain and it's defined as an output, then we can just put the two together. We just put what f of x is together and put with g of x is together with any arithmetic combination that we want to. Great. Nice direct idea. Arithmetic combination makes sense. We put in the same input to the two functions and then we combine their outputs with some predecided arithmetic operation. If it's sum, we do it through addition. If it's multiplication, we do it through multiplication, product, you know, things like that. But we can do something more interesting. We can compose one function with another. Instead of giving both functions the same input, we give the input to one function. Then we take the first function's output and we plug that into the second function. So input goes into one, and then an output comes out of that, and that immediately goes into the second function, and then finally we get an output of that. The second function is acting on the first function. Many lessons back, we first introduced the idea of a function, and we talked about how we can view it as a machine. It takes in inputs, and the function produces outputs, right? x goes into the machine, f, the function f, and then it gets spat out after having been acted on it, right? The function is some process. It does some transformation on x, so we get f of x, f having acted upon x, right? So that's the idea of it as a machine. We can expand this idea into function composition. Function composition is just linking multiple machines together in series. We just put multiple of them together. The output of the first function goes directly into the second as its input. So our first input goes into, say, g. And so it's now g of x. And then we plug all of g of x, plug all of g of x into f, and so we've got all of g of x now being acted upon by f. So input into the first machine, an output comes out of that machine, and then we just jam that right into the second machine. And if we wanted, we could string this up three, four, five, six, seven. We could string up as many of these machines in order as we wanted. We could compose as many functions as we wanted to, but it's easy to start off thinking about it in terms of two functions being composed together. We note the previous slide's composition. So when it went into g first and then went into f, as f 
composed with G. So this is just a little circle between them. F circle G, we read that as F composed with G. If F composed with G acts on X, acts on some input X, we have F composed with G of X, just like we would normally. We've created a new function out of putting the two together. By linking those two machines together, it's effectively one larger machine that's doing a new way of working. This means this, this machine, F composed with G, it acts on X first, G will act on X first, and then F will act on whatever results. So we've got F composed with G, and we can break it down into G goes first, then F goes on what results, the thing that comes out of that. Now notice the functions act in order of closeness, right? G goes on first, and then F goes on second because it's farther away. So we hit it with the things that are closest to the input that we're putting in. So G goes onto the X, and then F goes onto what results, and if we had even more stacked up, whatever was even further to the left would act after that. The functions act in order of closeness to the original input. There is another much easier way to see F composed with G of X in the, in the function notation format that we're already used to, the thing that we've been using for quite a while now. F composed with G of X is just F of G of X, right? So F composed with G of X, remember how we broke it into this guy went first and then F acted second? Well, that's what we've got right here. G is acting first and then F is acting second. Makes a lot of sense. I would recommend, I'd personally recommend, anytime you see this circle notation, this F composed with G stuff, rewrite it in this normal format, the format that we're used to at this point, the F of G of X. This normally will make it easier to understand and solve problems. There's very few downsides to breaking it into this thing. So I'd really recommend anytime you come up against a problem and you're not quite sure what to do and it's this sort of stuff, break it into F of G of X, F acting on G of X, something acting on something else acting on the input that you're putting in. This method, the second form of notation, this is really great as a way to look at things. I really recommend breaking, when you see this, break it into this thing right here. It'll really help you understand what's going on. Another way we can visually interpret it, and this is a little, it's a little hard to see what's going on here, but bear, you know, try to follow me on what I'm saying here. What we do is we start off with some X. We start off with X, and then we apply G to that X, right? G goes along and takes it to G of X. Then F comes along and it hits this G of X, and it turns into F acting on G of X. But we can also think of it as some new function that's been created, F composed with G, we've created a new machine that can just go directly from our original X to the end result of F of G of X. It does both of these actions, both of these processes in one thing. It's a machine that's built out of both of the machines inside of it. So we can look at it as stair-stepping across, or we can look at it as new, one new built giant leap, where it does both of these actions in one jump. Right? You can take steps across the pond, or you can take one giant leap, but ultimately they do the same thing. The leap has to be informed by how you would do the steps, though. So how do we actually use these composite functions? We understand the idea behind them now, and it turns out that using them actually isn't that hard. It's just important to understand the idea. Each function has its own rule, right? Like f of x equals x cubed means cube your input. So composing multiple functions just means using these rules in succession. This idea is shown beautifully in that notation. The notation I was talking about being the one I really recommend earlier, f of g of x. The function says, this says the function g acts on x, then f acts on the resulting g of x. So g acts on x, that's what this says right here, and then f acts on the resulting g of x. f acts on what we just had there. Great. Since we almost certainly know what g of x is and what f of x is from the problem, we just use that as an input for f. We use the rules that we were given earlier and we just apply them to these things. Let's see an example. For example, if we have f of x equals x squared plus 3 and g of x equals 2x minus 2, then f of g of x is equal to, well, what we see here, don't get tripped up by the fact that we've got x showing up multiple times. Remember, it's just a placeholder. f of x is just a way of saying f of whatever is in here, whatever, is in, whatever f is acting on. The thing that it's acting on will get squared plus 3. So if it's acting on g of x, then what's g of x? Well, g of x is 2x minus 2. So we're plugging in 2x minus 2. So then we plug that 
in for f of x, f of x becomes x squared plus 3. So if what's inside of the box is 2x minus 2, it's going to be 2x minus 2 squared. So the box has the same thing happen. The same process happens. It's just a new thing going on. Instead of x going into it, it's just 2x minus 2 going into it. The same process is it's taken the input, square it, add 3. So instead of taking an x, squaring it, and adding 3, we're taking in 2x minus 2, we're squaring 2x minus 2, and then we're adding 3. So if we wanted to at this point, we could expand 2x minus 2 squared plus 3, but this is really the key idea, is getting to this point of thinking it of it as boxes. We're plugging in based on boxes, and we'll see a bunch of examples using this idea later on, but you want to think of we are just swapping out. We're using x as a placeholder. It's not x that we're really attached to. f of x is saying f of box, and then what happens to box? f of placeholder, and then what happens to placeholder? f of input, and then what happens to input? That's the way you want to think about it, and that makes it really easy to do composite functions. All right, time for some examples. So f plus g of 3. So if we have f of x equals 2x plus 3, g of x equals x squared minus 7, what would f plus g of 3 be? So we do this, f of x is 2x plus 3, g of x is x squared minus 7, so we've got 2x plus 3 plus x squared minus 7. So that becomes something, we could simplify it, but at this point, let's plug in x equals 3, right? We've got x equals 3 is going to get plugged in, so we've got 2 times 3 plus 3 plus 3 squared minus 7. 6 plus 3 plus 9 minus 7. 9 plus 9, 18. 18 minus 7, 11. So we've got 11 as the answer here. All right, next one we'll do with the color blue, g minus f of 1. So what's g? g is x squared minus 7. What is f? Minus, and here's the key thing, it's not minus 2x, it's minus all of f. Not just the 2x, but minus 2x plus 3. It's a whole quantity that we have to be subtracting. Now we'll plug in, what happens when we plug in x equals 1? Well, we've got 1 squared minus 7 minus quantity 2 times 1 plus 3. So that's 1 minus 7 minus 2 plus 3, which is equal to negative 6 minus 5 equals negative 11. Great. Next one. Do this one in green. fg of negative 2. So what is f? f is 2x plus 3. And then we're multiplying that by g. So it's that whole f times the whole of g, x squared minus 7. So 2x plus 3, x squared minus 7. Now let's plug in negative 2. We plug in negative 2, we get 2 times negative 2 plus 3 has to be in that whole quantity times negative 2 squared minus, oops, accidentally made a plus sign, minus 7. Great. So that's equal to 2 times negative 2, which is negative 4 plus 3. Negative 2 squared is 4 minus 7. Negative 4 plus 3 gets us negative 1. 4 minus 7 gets us negative 3, and we get positive 3. Great. And finally, go back to red for our very last one, g over f of 8. So what is g? g is x squared minus 7 over all of f, so it's 2x plus 3. So we plug in x equals 8. So 8 squared minus 7 over 2 times 8 plus 3. 8 squared is 64 minus 7 over 2 times 8, 16 plus 3. 64 minus 7, we get 57 over 19, and it turns out 57 over 19, 19 times 2, we'll get up to 38. 19 times 3, we get up to 57. So 57 over 19, we get 3 once again by chance. Great. Also, I want to point out, if we wanted to, we could have done this by figuring out what f was and what g was separately. So notice, f of 3, for example, we use the f plus g of 3 just to uh, make a point here. So f of 3 is equal to 2 times 3 plus 3, which would be equal to 6 plus 3, or 9. g of 3 is equal to 3 squared minus 7, which equals 9 minus 7, or 2. So f plus g 
of 3 is equal to, by the way we defined it, f of 3 plus g of 3, which is equal to 9, f of 3, plus g of 3, 2, which equals 11, which, hey, that's the exact same thing that we got when we started off by adding it. So we can either put the functions together and then plug in the variable, or we can plug in the variable into each function and then add them together. Depends on the way we want to approach it. Sometimes it'll be more useful to do it one way, sometimes more useful to do it the other way, but it's important to notice that we can do it the other way. Second example. So same functions that we just wound up using. f of x equals 2x plus 3. g of x equals x squared minus 7. What is f composed with g first? So we'll start off with green for this one. f composed with g of x. So f composed with g of x, what was my recommendation? It was f of g of x is the exact same thing. It's another way to say this. Exact same thing. But in my opinion, much easier to understand what's going on. So f of g of x. So f of g of x. f of x equals 2x plus 3, but we don't need that information yet. We need to plug in g of x first. So x squared minus 7, f of x squared minus 7. Now, what is the x? Here's our x here, and x goes right here. So that means f of box is equal to 2 times box plus 3. The thing in the box now is x squared minus 7. So that gives us f of 2 times, sorry, f of x squared minus 7 is 2 times the thing in the box, x squared minus 7 plus 3. And if we wanted to, we could expand that out. We expand that out pretty easily, and we'd get 2x squared minus 14 plus 3, which is 2x squared minus 11. Great. Next one. So blue for the next one. g composed with f of x. Much easier to write it as g of f of x. So what is f of x? f of x is 2x plus 3. So that's what's going into g right now. 2x plus 3. And now if we plug into g, g of box equals box squared minus 7. So g of 2x plus 3 is equal to quantity 2x plus 3, that's the thing in the box, squared minus 7. We work that out, we get 4x squared, 2x times 2x is 4x squared, plus 2x plus 3 and 3 plus 2x, so 6x plus 6x, 12x, plus 3 times 3, 9 minus 7, which equals 4x squared plus 12x plus 2. Great. Okay, next one. Let's use red for this one. f composed with f, f composed with itself. So f composed with itself, we can also write this as f of f of x. So what is f of x? f of x is 2x plus 3, so f of 2x plus 3. And now the thing in our box is 2x plus 3, so it is f of box equals 2 box plus 3. So f of 2x plus 3 is 2 times quantity 2x plus 3 plus 3. Great. We just worked this out. 2 times quantity 2x plus 3, 4x plus 6 plus 3 equals 4x plus 9. There we are. On to the very last one. Use green again. G composed with G of X, so G of G of X, much easier to see what's going on that way. G of X is X squared minus 7. So now it's G acting on X squared minus 7. Remember, G of box is equal to box squared minus 7. So if we're plugging in X squared minus 7, it's going to be quantity X squared minus 7 squared. Remember, box squared minus 7, and then also minus 7. Great. So we square x squared minus 7, x squared times x squared, x to the fourth, x squared minus 7, 7x squared, minus 7 times x squared, another minus 7x squared. So we've got negative 7x squared plus negative 7x squared minus 14x squared. And negative 7 times negative 7, positive 49. And finally, minus 7. So x to the fourth minus 14x squared plus 42. There we are. 
bunch of different function compositions, but it's not that hard as long as we're plugging one thing into the other and remembering in terms of the substitution. It's not about x, it's not about the letter x, it's about if we just had a box here, if we just had a placeholder here, if we just had this thing to hold a space and then we saw what happened to that space when it was held open. If we put in an input, what happens to the input? We just happen to use x because it's a convenient thing, we're used to using it as a placeholder, but x isn't inherently important. It's just the idea of what happens to an input. So if we plug in something like 2x plus 3, different things will happen than if we just plugged in x. Also, one other thing I want to point out. Notice that in general, f of g of x is not equal. They're normally very different than g of f of x. For the most part, Flipping the order that we do our function composition in gives us very, very different results. Sometimes it'll wind up being the same result, but for the most part, if we go 1fg or gf, it'll be totally different. So for the most part, f composed with g is a totally different function than g composed with f. And this is just something to keep in mind, that composition order matters very much. We can see it in what we got here, right? f of g of x got us 2x squared minus 11, but g of f of x got us 4x squared plus 12x plus 2. Totally different results. So the order that you put it in, the order that one function goes into another, the order of composition, massive importance. Great. Next example. Let f of x equal x plus 1, g of x equal 2x, h of x equal square root of x plus 1. What is the domain of f divided by g composed with h? And then also of h composed with g composed with f. So we'll start off with f of g composed with h. Now, very first thing we want to do is we want to figure out what the heck is f of g, right? Sorry, not f of g. What's the heck of f divided by g? Well, f over g of x is just equal to f of x over g of x, except for when it's undefined, when g of x is equal to 0. So what does this, what's this mean? Well, x, f of x is x plus 1, so x plus 1 over 2x. And there we are. f divided by g of x is equal to x plus 1 over 2x. Great. Now we can just go back to what we're used to doing. So we'll use blue for this guy. So f over g of h of x, much easier to see it written in that format. So f over g, what is h of x, f over g of square root of x plus 1 equals square root of x plus 1 plus 1 over 2 times square root of x plus 1. So how do we figure out the domain? So domain, so this right here is not our answer but it is the function that comes out from that composition. f divided by g composed with h comes out to be square root of x plus 1 plus 1 divided by 2 times the square root of x plus 1. So the domain is going to be everywhere where it doesn't break on us. So what things in here can break? Well, first off, square root. Anytime we see square root, square root breaks when negative inside, right? So if we've got x plus 1 going in in both cases, if x plus 1 is less than 0, that is to say x plus 1 is a negative value, then we've got breaking. So it breaks, it's not defined more formally, when x plus 1 is less than 0, which is to say when x is less than negative 1. So that's one important point of information. x less than negative 1 means failure. Another failure point is if this bottom part is equal to 0, right? So breaks, so we've got another break if 2 root x plus 1 equals 0. And that's going to wind up being x plus 1 is equal to 0, which means x equals negative 1. So it fails if either of these conditions happen. So fails if x is equal to negative 1 or x is less than negative 1, which is to say x is less than or equal to negative 1. So its actual domain, so the domain of this function is x greater than negative 1. It's all of the places 
where the function does not fail, where the function does not break. The domain is everything that can go in. We know everything that breaks it, x less than negative 1, x equal to negative 1. So the domain is everything that does not break it, so x greater than negative 1. All right, what if we composed h with g with f? All right, so h composed with g composed with f might seem scary at first, but remember we can break it into a much more pleasant, easy to work with h of g of f of x. So first off, what is f of x? So it's h of g of what was f of x? f of x is x plus 1. So what is x plus 1? So g of box is 2 times box. So g of x plus 1, so it's still h of, but g of x plus 1 is going to be 2 times x plus 1. So let's simplify that inside just a little bit. So it's h of 2 distribute, so we get 2x plus 2. So we've got h of 2x plus 2 equals, we plug that in here. So remember, box, h of box is box plus 1, square root of box plus 1, sorry. So h of 2x plus 2 is square root of quantity 2x plus 2 plus 1, which is equal to the square root of 2x plus 3. Great. So once again, this is not our answer, but it's going to help us figure out our answer. So the square root of 2x plus 3 is what the function winds up being. That's what h composed with g composed with f of x is. It is this thing right here. It's equal to the square root of 2x plus 3. So when does square root of 2x plus 3 break? Well, once again, breaks it fails when negative inside. So if 2x plus 3 is negative, it breaks down. So 2x plus 3 less than 0. So 2x less than negative 3, which is when x is less than negative 3 over 2, we've got failure. So it's going to be the reverse of that. Everything that doesn't cause failure is the domain. So the domain is going to be everything that isn't x less than negative 3 over 2, which is going to be everything greater than negative 3 over 2 or equal to it. So x is greater than or equal to negative 3 over 2. When it's big enough to not cause a negative to show up inside that square root. Great. Final example, the volume of a spherical balloon is given by volume equals 4 thirds pi r cubed. The balloon starts being inflated at time t equals 0 in seconds, and its radius in centimeters is given by r equals 3 times the square root of t. Okay, wait, so what, what does that mean? Let's try to figure it out real quickly. So we've got a spherical balloon. Well, a sphere, a sphere is just a ball, right? So that's basically what we expect when we think of balloons. So this is making sense, right? And it's being inflated, it's being blown up. And at time t equals 0, so that's just when we start, its radius is given by r equals 3 root t. So it starts at t equals 0. And what is its radius at t equals 0? r equals 3 root t, so 3 times square root of 0. Oh, so its radius is 0. So it starts off completely small, it's completely uninflated, it's just a dot at zero. And then from there, it inflates, so it grows out from that point, it grows out from that moment in time. Give the volume of the balloon as a function of time. So we blow into the balloon, and the radius expands, and the radius expands, and the radius expands. And as the radius expands, there's now volume inside of the balloon. What is the volume at 30 seconds? All right, so first thing we need to do is we need to give the volume of the balloon as a function of time. Well, first off, we might want to see these as functions, because right now, v equals 4 thirds pi r cubed, r equals 3 root t, they're not actually functions right now, but we could easily turn them into functions. So volume is really just a function of radius, because the only thing that can vary in there is the radius. So it's 4 thirds pi r cubed. Simple function. And then what about radius? Well, radius is a function based off of time, because the only thing that can vary in it is time, 3 root t. So the volume of the balloon is a function of time. Well, volume of the balloon doesn't have time inside of it. But we do know that volume has radius inside of it. And radius has time inside of it. So we can just put these together. We can compose them. And volume of radius of time will be equal to a function based off of time that will give the volume of the balloon. So let's see what that is. Volume of 3 root t. 
oh, hey, now we're just plugging in the radius at any given time. And that's going to be volume of 3 root t. So if we plugged in our box for r, that gives us box here cubed times the other stuff. So it's going to be 4 thirds pi times quantity 3 root t cubed. We simplify this out a bit. We get 4 thirds pi times 3 cubed. times the square root of t cubed. So notice, 3 cubed, well, that can cancel down to a squared and knock this guy out. So we've got 4 pi times 3 squared. Well, 4 pi 3 squared, hey, what is 3 squared? 3 squared is 9. 4 times 9 is 36. So we've got 36 pi. What about root t cubed? Well, remember, root t squared root t squared, let's put in a different color so we don't get it confused, root t squared would just be equal to t on its own, so root t cubed is just one extra root t left over, so that gives us times t root t. And there we are. This is the volume of this balloon, volume of radius of time, but it's also a way of seeing volume that's purely in terms of t, right? t shows up, t shows up, but pi is a constant, 36 is a constant. So what we've got now is we've got volume based purely off of time. We've got the first part of this question done. Next part, volume at 30 seconds. Well, we've got two options for how to do this. We could plug in into the function that we just built. Volume at 30 equals 36 pi times 30 times square root of 30. Or we could plug in volume of radius at time t which would be volume of 3 times square root of 30, which would be equal to um, 4 thirds pi quantity 3 root 30 cubed. And it winds up being the case that these two things actually wind up equaling the exact same thing. So let's just fold them together. So 36 pi times 30 times root 30, that winds up equaling 1080 pi square root of 30. And if we want to get this as an approximate value, something that we could actually know a number as opposed to just having symbols that are precise and accurate and exactly correct and right, but hard to actually grasp as a single number and know what we're talking about, we could get a pretty close thing and we could round this to 8,584 using a calculator. What's the units that it come in, comes in? Well, it's centimeters cubed because if radius is in centimeter and volume is centimeters cubed, and it makes sense because we're talking about volume and length is centimeters, area is centimeters squared, and volume is centimeters cubed, at least if we're using centimeters. If we're using meters, it's meters, meters squared, meters cubed. If we're using inches or feet, it is square inches, square feet, and cubic inches, cubic feet. All right, great. That completes it for composite functions. I hope you have a much better understanding of what's going on. Remember, when you see that circle, it means composed with, but it's much easier to break it into f of g of x, or g of f of x, depending on the order it goes in. And remember, it's just going to be based off of the order that they're hitting the x in. Whoever's closer goes first, so this becomes f of g gets to act first because it's closer to the x. That's what that means. Whoever's closer goes first, so it's whatever the order is with the circles, but now f of g of x. f circle g x becomes f of g of x. a circle b circle c of x becomes a of b of c of x. Great. All right. Um, glad to have taught you the composite functions. Hope you can use it in a bunch of places. It will show up in a variety of things. Really useful stuff here. And we'll see you at educator.com later. Bye.